So my talk today is going to be about Libratus and counterfactual regret minimization. Libratus is a poker AI that plays heads up, no limit hold'em, and counterfactual regret minimization is one of the algorithms that it uses. Um, before we get into details about Libratus, um, I thought it'd be helpful just to quickly walk through some prior game AIs. Um, there's a pretty rich history of like researchers building out AIs to solve different games. Um, one being Deep Blue, which plays chess. Another being AlphaGo, which plays Go. Um, there's a distinction between these games and poker in that poker is a game with imperfect information. So the opponents that you play uh, don't have their whole cards exposed, so there's a level of uncertainty in the game that uh, Go and chess don't necessarily have. And then within poker, there's also a distinction between limit poker and no limit poker. Um, limit poker, with limit poker, there's a very finite set of game states that you can uh, achieve, whereas in no limit, because you can bet any amount, uh, the, be the game becomes a little more complex. Uh, in 2015, there was a poker AI bot called Cepheus, uh, which weakly solved limit heads up limit hold them. Um, and by solving, that basically means that um, researchers found what's more or less like a Nash equilibrium strategy. Um, more recently, uh, earlier this year, uh, Libratus, which is a heads up, no limit uh, poker playing AI, uh, defeated uh, four like elite pros. And uh, while it's uncertain that while it's uncertain how close of a Nash equilibrium strategy Libratus plays, um, it's pretty clear that it's better than pretty much every single human being at this point. Um, cool. So I'm going to go into a little bit uh, more detail as to how Libratus was measured. So in January 2017 this year, um, Libratus was uh, put up against four heads up, no limit pros. Um, You've got the two researchers in the middle and the, the four pros on the outside. Um, they played over the course of three weeks, and in three weeks they played 120,000 hands. Um, there were some like variance reduction implementations as part of the uh, challenge or experiment to um, try and make sure that the results from the challenge uh, were reliable and were indicative of like the true skill edge um, for humans or for the AI. Um, and to set some additional context, there was um, a predecessor to Libratus called Claudico. Um, the challenge for Claudico took place in uh, May 2015. Um, it was a different group of pros, but pretty similar skill set. Um, the pros kind of wrecked Claudico. Um, and then just a year later, Libratus like, wrecked these pros. So it was kind of crazy to see that. Um, this table kind of summarizes the um, Libratus, or the Libratus and the Claudico challenges, as well as some details about the actual programs. So, um, firstly, in terms of like computation effort, um, Libratus is a little more complex and computationally intense. Um, Claudico was played in mid 2015. Libratus was earlier this year. Um, in terms of number of hands played, um, the challenge with Libratus. Um, had 50% more hands, and this was just an effort to reduce variance and just make sure that the results of the challenge were reliable. In terms of outcome, um, it's a pretty drastic difference. So Libratus like, bodied these humans. Um, and the last line represents win rate, which is kind of like a unit of measurement in, uh, in poker. And uh, usually, like three to six big blinds over 100 hands is like a reliable indication that you're like a winning player. So for Libratus to win 15 big blinds per 100, it's um, pretty remarkable, remarkable, and it's pretty indicative that it's just a lot better. Um, next slide. Uh, these pros did a Reddit AMA, and um, I found a couple of posts that are really interesting, so I'm just going to read off the questions. Uh, so first question was, how excited are you guys to go crush some regular human opponents after trying to grind it out against Skynet? More seriously, how, is, how has your strategy improved from facing an opponent like Libratus? Are you going to start overbetting more frequently than you think, or frequently you think? 
And Jason Les, who actually was the biggest loser out of the four pros, but he said, once you face Labratus, there's nothing worse any human could ever do to you. Every human is going to seem like a walk in the park. And then the second paragraph just refers to overbetting, which was a um, strategy that Labratus seemed to employ really well. Um, humans like will also overbet in certain situations, but I don't think it's as optimal as uh, what Labratus is probably doing. And then here's uh, another post. Do you guys think that if you could? Do you guys think that if you had a year to review the hand histories, that you could beat this current version of the AI, or at least come close, uh, Jason? I think if we had infinite time to study and play on any schedule we wanted, we could get closer, but I don't think we could beat it. So it's like truly like a really strong AI and like, like no one's going to beat it. Um, cool. So in terms of what Labrat is actually made of, it's made of three different algorithms. One is self-taught artificial intelligence. So this is the counterfactual regret minimization um, algorithm. Another is an end game solver, which was used to make decisions uh, towards the end of a given hand, so on the turn in the river. And then lastly, in between each day of competition, the researchers ran uh, kind of a, uh, an improvement algorithm to help Labratus identify like patterns uh, and patch up like weaknesses in its play from the prior day. Um, and then to kind of like define counterfactual regret minimization, um, so counterfactual kind of just refers to the idea of like looking back, like if I had known. Um, regret just means how much better would I have done if I had done something else instead. And minimization is the idea of uh, implementing a strategy that reduces your overall level of regret. And if you um, teach this algorithm the rules of a game, um, you have it play against itself over large enough iterations, um, you'll eventually reach an average strategy that uh, is, on average, unexploitable. So that just means that um, the best that an opponent can do against the strategy is just break even. Um, and that's pretty synonymous to uh, a Nash equilibrium. And um, this applies to um, zero-sum games with two players. And then I'm going to quickly go through an example with rock, paper, scissors. And this table just kind of shows the difference in complexity. So in rock, paper, scissors, when you have two players, you have nine game states. So player one can do one of three choices. Player two can do one of three choices. Um, for this example, 10,000 iterations was enough to like more or less reach a Nash equilibrium. Um, and heads up, no limit hold'em, your number of game states is 10 to the 165. And Labratus actually went through over a trillion iterations to teach itself how to play. So I will quickly walk through some code that um, kind of implements a very vanilla counterfactual uh, regret minimization algorithm. So here, uh, we're just kind of setting up the rules of the game. So rock, paper, scissors. Um, log just means that we're going to log out some comments while uh, the algorithm is running. Um, in the constructor of this RPS trainer, um, there are like two sets of information. One is uh, strategy of one represents uh, a player and one represents the player's opponent. Um, and it's set up in this way to allow the algorithm to play itself. So both of these two entities are um, adjusting their strategies based off iterations of playing each other. Um, so strategy represents a current strategy um, that um, the algorithm is implementing in that time. Uh, regret sum is a way to aggregate the regrets for um, all of the games played. And then strategy sum is a way to sum up all of the um, strategies that have been used for each iteration. And then the idea is as you aggregate this strategy sum for large enough n, if you take the average of this strategy sum, you arrive at a uh, strategy that becomes more and more unexploitable. So this running this algorithm will approach a Nash equilibrium. Um, get strategy is um, just a way to initialize a strategy. So what I've, I've done something small where the initial strategy is just a random strategy employed. Um, and when I say strategy for rock, paper, scissors, it's just basically 
three probabilities. One is the probability that you play rock, another is the probability that you play paper, and the third is uh, the probability that you play scissors. Um, so here I've like kind of made it a little difficult in that like these two algorithms are um, starting off with just random strategies. Um, and then over time, um, uh, this algorithm will train against itself, and what it'll do is it will use the current strategy of the player and of the opponent. It will play each other. Uh, it will calculate the regret based on the outcome of the game, and then it will update the aggregate regret. Once the aggregate regret is updated, uh, a new current strategy will produce, so one strategy for the next iteration. And then in addition to that, the aggregate cumulative uh, strategy sum will be um, added up as well. And over a large enough uh, number of iterations, you'll eventually uh, approach a cumulative strategy sum that you can average. And if you do average that, you'll end up with a Nash equilibrium. Um, for a two-player game, that's zero sum. So if I run this guy, um, and it'll be 10,000 iterations, and it'll go pretty quickly, um, you'll see that, oh, it's actually a little bit cut off, but at the bottom, the final average strategy is 34%, 33.3%, and 32.4%, um, which approximates the Nash equilibrium for rock, paper, scissors, which is just choosing like one third for um, all three options. Um, and, that, and then the last thing I just wanna end on is a quote by one of the researchers that kind of just talks about the implications of this uh, algorithm. So there are definitely applications beyond poker. None of, the none of the techniques we use are specific to poker. They can be applied to negotiations, auctions, security interactions, or any strategic situation where there's hidden information. I also see this as fundamental research into the problem of dealing with uncertainty in the real world. Um, so this is just an example of AI like becoming more prominent in areas where there's imperfect information. And I think um, it's, I guess, very favorable or very unfavorable, depending on how you see it. Um, but it just means that um, AI is probably going to have a larger and larger role in our lives moving forward. And I think that's it. Thanks.